and welcome to my channel, bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne, my name is Muriel and it is time for another monthly reading wrap up. In the month of May I read a total of 10 books, four of which were graphic novels. Of course, first thing I should say is yes, I finished my big reread of all my Chronicles of Poem books. It was overall quite an enjoyable experience, it was fun, but I have to say some aspects of the series have not aged well by any means, but of course I'll be doing a review video from the entire series and my experience with it very soon. So first week of May I continued on with The White Dragon and it was all right. A big flaw with this book I think is that I didn't like the main character. It's very character-centered story around a male character named Jackson and his white dragon Ruth. Ruth is adorable though. He's just, oh, you want to hug him, like just adorable dragon. But Jackson was kind of an asshole and yeah, the story's told from his point of view primarily, so eh. And along with that I read a non-fiction book called Utopia for Realists by Rutger Bregman. So this is a not really political science book, but yeah, it's a bit about that, economics, political science, ways in which to make society better, I guess, is the easiest way of describing this. It looks at basically three main ideas, universal basic income, a shorter work week, and the abolition of uh, borders, or the opening of borders, that wasn't super clear. The author's leitmotif is that society needs ideals to move forward and better itself, and he says that in the 21st century most of Western society and first world countries are stuck and stagnating because we don't have a utopia to aspire to, in a way. Even though we've never lived so well as we do now, we are richer than we ever were, healthier, etc etc. I gave three stars to this book. I don't fundamentally disagree with most of the ideas in there, so I was already open-minded about them, but I think it does a pissable job of convincing anyone who isn't already open to those ideas. The citations are a mess, a lot of them are like blog articles or like online newspaper articles or his own writing, so that's bad. He opens the book with a chapter that just made me very angry and I was like really tempted to DNF it right there and then by saying that, well yeah, we've never been better than we are now and that in the past everyone was miserable, sick, ugly, stupid, and I hate those types of assertions because history, if anything, is not linear. It is not a linear progression. The only exception to that might be technology, and even then it's slightly debatable depending on which period you're looking at. So first off, I hate that. Don't get me wrong, I hate the opposite assertion that everything was better in the past because that's blatantly false as well. I'm just saying both positions are very black and white and are that accurate a rule, so. I mean, he doesn't really go into the arguments people might use to counter his ideas of like universal basic income or, you know, shorter work weeks, which I think is a bit of a weakness, more or less in favour of those ideas or trying them out or some variation thereof, but if you're going to try and persuade other people, you need to go deeper. Basically it's very superficial in a way, and for these big ideas I think you do need to go a bit deeper into, well, arguments for and against, source material, studies, etc. I mean, he does cite studies, but it's just very surface level stuff. Like I said, I'm open to UBI, I'm open to um, shorter work weeks. I mean, I think the whole way society is built around work and labour needs a major massive rethink. And then when it comes to borders, there I'm a bit more hesitant, but it's never really clear, like I mentioned, whether he's in favour of abolishing any and all types of borders or just relaxing them a bit, and the arguments he uses are crap. I mean that's clearly the weakest part of the book, like if it's not gonna convince someone like me who's already liberal on the left etc, it's not gonna convince anyone else. And last thing, the title of this book is Utopia for Realists. And I'm sorry, but the overall tone of this book, the way it dodges counter-arguments, and given how superficial it overall is, it should be renamed Utopia for Optimists on Crack. And I'm not at all an optimist. That's why I was interested in this book in the first place. I was like, 
oh, practical solutions. I'm interested, it might actually make me a bit more optimistic. This isn't for realists, it's for optimists on cracks. I was really pissed off because I hate false advertising. Anyway, so I'm sure there are better books out there on the subjects of UBI, reinventing work, society, etc. If you're interested in those subjects, I wouldn't really recommend this book. Then onwards and forwards with my Chronicles of Pern. So I read, reread Dragon's Dawn, and that one was actually markedly better than some of the previous entries. This is kind of like the origin story of Pern. This is not a spoiler, by the way, but so Pern was settled by Terran colonists, and this is basically presented in every single preface to every single book she wrote, so it's not a spoiler, you know that going in, even though I didn't remember that I knew that going in when I read this back when I was 11, 12, 13, so that's interesting. But this really takes a specific look at the colonization process of Pern and what the colonists did to survive on Pern, etc. And it was fairly enjoyable, though again, problematic elements in which I will go into detail in my review. Along with that, I reread Monstrous Volume 1 to then follow it up with Monstrous Volume 2. I've already mentioned these graphic novels. It's in a fantasy, steampunky, sort of matriarchal world where you have different races, you've got sentient cats. Well, I mean, cats are sentient, but I mean, like, civilized, intelligent, humanoid cats almost, and like half animal, half human hybrids, and you've got this young woman who's possessed by a god, a demon, it's not yet very clear what it's supposed to be. Aesthetically speaking, it's beautiful, I love the art style, and the story is very compelling, I definitely want to continue with this series, so basically I have only good stuff to say about this. I would say the second volume was just slightly less good than the first, Probably because it's a bit shorter and, you know, just continues the story. It ends on a cliffhanger of sorts. You just really want to learn more. So, like, there's less exposition and active um, explanations regarding the world building, the history, than in the first volume. But I assume I'll be getting more information in following entries. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend this series if you haven't read it yet. Then, the week following of that, I reread all the weirds of Pern. And now that I've actually finished my reread, I think this is probably the one I enjoyed the most. It's not the last one, it's the, like the penultimate book in the main storyline, though I do think there is a Chronicles of Pern book that follows this one and precedes the very last one, chronologically speaking, but I've never read it and I didn't have it and I didn't intend on reading it, so that's that. But yeah. It brings a major change to the society of Pern and to its future prospects. And there's a lot of stuff happening, lots of character perspectives, less of the cringy problematic stuff too. So that was major plus. So yeah, solid novel. And along with that, I finally started Saga, the graphic novel series. So I read the first two volumes. And it's really, really good. In this instance, I get the hype. What is Saga? Um, it's a science fantasy saga, <laughs> as the title implies. You have these two lovers from different alien but still very humanoid species, and their peoples have been at war for years, even perhaps decades and they defect from their respective armies, they fall in love, and they have a child together, and basically everyone else around them wants to kill them. Or, I guess, capture them with some weird prophecy stuff. Yeah, and the art style's really good, and the story's really good, and there's a lot of humour and weird shit. There are TV-headed people. TV-headed people. And also, it's very much an NSFW series, and there's, there's a scene of a couple of TV-headed people going at it doggy style, and that's very interesting. <laughs> very weird. So, major points for originality, and there's like a spider, centaur, human type thing who's an assassin, and they've got a whole spaceship planetoid thing that's a bordello with weird orgy scenes, and political machinations, and there is magic, and there is technology, that's why I call it science fantasy. It's a wild ride, and then ghosts too. It's a wild ride. I would recommend it if you're into that kind of thing. I'm certainly looking forward to reading uh, the rest of the series. It's not actually finished. I've heard that there are nine volumes published so far, and 
it's been on a break for a while, I think, but the author and the illustrator said that they are going to continue the series at some point. So lots of good stuff to look forward to, basically. <laughs> and then first I'm going to mention the non-fiction title I read. Invisible Women by Caroline Crado Perez. This book is about big data, analyzed under a feminist lens, basically showing how the world has been and still is primarily androcentric, which means that the male point of view is considered the standard point of view, the male body is considered to be the standard human body, etc, etc, which is kind of, yeah, feminism 101, but this relies on cold hard numbers, a crap ton of cold hard numbers in lots of different domains. Medicine, pharmacology, politics, ergonomics, transportation, tool use, disaster relief, lots of stuff. It basically proves patriarchy in a way, or androcracy, or just, well yeah, androcentrism. It, it proves it. In a weird way, this is the best book to convince someone of the validity of feminism. It's not about ethics, it's not about philosophy or just more abstract feminist theory. This is all about hard numbers, which is brilliant in a way, but also, and this is I think an important warning, incredibly bloody depressing. I admit that I probably wasn't in the greatest state of mind to read this to begin with, but honestly, I found this genuinely upsetting at times because there's very little you feel you can actually do about any of the stuff she mentions in her book. It's all about how the system is rigged against women, but she does a great job of saying, you know, it's not necessarily malevolent on the part of men, or more specifically the men in power or in charge of all the things she discusses. She's very, very generous, I feel, even in places where she really does not need to be. And the introductory chapter really introduces the notion of androcentrism very well. Like, even in gendered languages, the male pronoun is considered the neutral pronoun, and this is very true in French. I mean, this is stuff that Simone de Beauvoir talks about in, like, The Second Sex, and lots of second wave feminists have theorized upon this, but like I said, she proves it in a way with hard data, which is very interesting, but like I said, very depressing. And she does give a couple of figures that sound hopeful. She says a couple of times that some things are getting a bit better in some areas. But yeah, it's very depressing if you're female, like me, and I assume it would be depressing for anyone who has females in his or her life that he or she loves and cares about, especially in the domain of medicine. That's honestly terrifying to realize that most medications, we don't know if they have specific sex-based secondary adverse effects or whether something is going to truly work for women because there are almost no females in medical trials. Or, you know, the fact that we don't know that much about the female reproductive system and its specificities. I'm already prone to anxiety and this did not help. And you don't really know what to do. I mean, I guess unless you're a scientist and you can change things, or you're a politician, you can actually change things. I would hope people who are in charge, women who are in charge, and men who are in charge and who are open-minded about these things, read this and then try to do something about it. Because as an average citizen, I have no idea what to do about 90% of this stuff. So very, very important book. Like I said, probably one of the best tools in the feminist toolbox to actually explain how we still very much need feminism, but at the same time it makes you feel very disempowered. And I don't even like the concept of empowerment, but in this case it's really relevant. That's probably the main reason why I didn't give it 10, no not 10 stars on Goodreads, but like 5 stars on Goodreads. It deserves 5 stars. I gave it a 9 out of 10 in my own rating system just because of that very depressing aspect that makes you feel powerless to do anything to change how things function in society. And also she does throw, like I said, a crap ton of numbers at you. It gets a bit intense, even for me. I mean, I enjoy statistics and hard numbers, so it didn't bother me that much, but I can understand how a lot of people would get overwhelmed. I do recommend this, but like, with a, <laughs> a warning, this might make you very depressed and anxious, especially if you're really prone to those things. But, um, Good on Caroline Crider Press for writing this. It must have taken her quite a bit of time to gather all that data. And finally, let's end the wrap up on a slightly more positive note. So I finished my Chronicles of Pern reread with the only new read of the series, The Skies of Pern. This is one of the only books in my life, one of 
only two books, in fact, that I have DNF'd. And I finally read it, and thus concluded my journey through Pern. Because this is actually the last entry, chronologically speaking, in the Chronicles of Pern. I do think she published, perhaps, another couple of books after that, but then I think she died not that long after that. But do not quote me on that because I'm not sure at all. It was a bit disappointing, I guess, ultimately. Definitely not the best one. I gave it three stars. There are interesting new characters and familiar characters that come back. Some story arcs get concluded, but in the end a couple of things are just left open-ended in a very unsatisfying way. And the ending for other concluded story arcs felt a bit convenient, a bit cheesy. In general, a couple of the plot devices just felt very convenient and, you know, repetitive with regards to plot devices she'd used in previous entries in the series. I was like, oh come on, really? You're doing that again? So yeah, you know, I was like finishing the last 10 pages and I was like, oh, it's over. It's done. This is how it ends? Really? It's not terrible or anything. I mean, there are a couple of interesting themes in there, and I'll talk about those in my general review of the series, but yeah, I feel a bit flat, I guess. But I'm glad I finally read it, though. I did it. And now that I'm done with the series, honestly, I don't really see myself reading these books ever again. I will remain somewhat attached to them, I think, and I will keep them in my library, because yes, I do keep books that I never intend on reading again. I'm selective about it, but that's something I do. Like I said, I don't think it has aged that well. I'm very, very surprised at all the stuff I just ignored when I was 11, 12. I mean, I was 11, 12, yes, but I, I really thought that those things would have bothered me even back then. I guess I was just so rah-rah dragons that I could <laughs> overlook those problematic aspects. I cannot overlook them now at all. Especially since I know there are other series with dragons that are just as good or better. It's not enough, in a way, to, you know, redeem these books. I mean, they don't need to be redeemed exactly, but um, I don't see it justifying a future reread of the series in any case. But, like I said, I enjoyed the experience. It was overall pretty fun, and even if the dragons can't, you know, counterbalance quite the problematic elements, they are a very appealing element nonetheless. And that concludes my wrap-up for the month of May. It also concludes my first major reread of the year. The other one that I have planned is to reread His Dark Materials and then to read the first two books in the Book of Dust trilogy. Now, unlike the Chronicles of Pern, which I did enjoy when I was younger, His Dark Materials was a favourite, like a major favourite of which I have very, very fond memories. So I'm very curious to see what I'm gonna make of them now, you know, age 27. And also I really need to finish watching the TV adaptation because I, I haven't finished it, I got distracted by other things. So I'll probably do both of those things in conjunction. That will be for the month of August. But until then I'm going to go back to standalones or duologies and primarily science fiction, well actually the Cardinals of Penal science fiction, silly me, but standalones, duologies, shorter books to, well, not even give you a breather, but a change of pace, something a bit different. I like uh, contrasting things like that, you know, take a big series, then switch to shorter books, and then get back to a bigger series. And of course, I hope you're all doing well. I wish you a lovely day or evening, and I shall see you in the next video, which will be my review of The Chronicles of Pern, which, fingers crossed, won't take me too long. But in the meantime, I bid you farewell. <laughs> Bye-bye.